Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to the first financial meeting to the President's package tonight. Um, this is also being broadcast live on Channel 99. And it'll be shown for the next couple weeks, uh, two times a day, over the next couple weeks. Um, so if there's anything you missed tonight, we'll get you get on there. Um, just want to remind you of what's signed in so far tonight. Thank you. Uh, and we'll see you later on. I uh, told you about the schedule. I'd like to introduce the board if I could. Uh, Brian Pierce, clerk. Matt Stelmack, vice chair. And Matt, uh, Mike Rivers, uh, the chairman. I'm Sean Hamilton, the general manager. Uh, I'd like to thank Susan Denton over there from Herbs and Don's office for joining us tonight. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, we're going to start tonight off with, with uh, Mike Rivers. wants to give a look at how we got here tonight as far as the vote from last year and what we need to get to the next vote, what we need to do. So. Okay, sure. Yeah, just to walk through the process a little bit, um, when, we, when we came up with the idea of, of exploring bringing natural gas to town, um, the first thing we have to do is get the franchise rights. And there's a process that's laid out in, in state law uh, under Mass General Law Chapter 164. It hasn't been used in a very long time. But basically the process says that there has to be an affirmative vote by the town. Um, there has to be two special town meetings. Uh, they have to be at least three months apart and not more than 13 months apart. So as most of you know, we, we had the first meeting last December and that, that passed overwhelmingly. And so we're coming up on the deadline to um, have the second meeting or else we have to go a period of years um, before we can do it again. And we're gonna go through the process of where we're at right now. Um, it's, it's, Ken will we'll go through it a bit more and talk. Um, we're hoping to have a meeting, a special town meeting in uh, late November, early December. Uh, that's up to coordinating with the town administrator and then the board of selectmen would, would call the meeting officially um, and that would be the process. So. Okay, if I could, uh, by way of introduction to Ken Stanley, I'd just like to give you a little bio information on Ken Stanley. Uh, we've been working with Ken for quite a few months now, putting this program together and a different, it's a big project that we've taken by the town, so we went about it through pretty quickly and we found a pretty, pretty qualified gentleman. Uh, Ken Stanley is the president and CEO of Trimon Engineering Company. He leads the firm in the field of energy development involving natural gas infrastructure development, including transmission, distribution, and storage. Uh, he's over 28 years in the engineering field uh, consulting service prior to joining Trimon Engineering. He spent 23 years as owner and vice president of Cooler and Colantino. Did I get it correct? Of Novo Mass. An engineering firm where his duties include the oversight of 125 person energy infrastructure consulting group. Uh, this group supported the natural gas, oil, products, electric industry, and multiple projects in transmission, distribution, including work on the Clinton delivery line right next door, and the 120 mile northeast expansion from upstate New York through Massachusetts. Um, it's developed projects for major utility transmission companies, including National Grid, NSTAR, and, and Bay State Gas. Um, He's let his firm grow nationally. His firm has offices now in Denver, Houston, Dayton, Ohio, and before New England. Um, and additionally, developed projects in 32 states across the U.S. and Canada. Um, he has local roots. We've got a local guy. He, he has a native Hudson, Mass. He lived in Clinton and Lancaster area right next to the for seven years while working for the Charles Perkins Company, engineering surveying uh, formerly of Clinton. Prior to entering the civilian arena, Ken served as an active duty member of the United States Air Force, Special Forces, Special Ops. His military responsibilities include the operation of navigation gates, airfield management of short field landing zones, drop zones, and extraction zones, as well as a multi-positional air traffic control operator, located in the USA and Central America. So uh, you can understand by his bio, he's not had extensive experience in area natural gas, but he's also a battle tester, which makes him perfect for this presentation. So, Ken, it's all yours. All right, please. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to your meeting. Uh, I'm not sure. It's been a, uh, it's actually has been about a year uh, process that we've been going through to uh, assist the town of Sterling to evaluate does it make sense, does it not make sense to have a local LDC uh, owned by the town. Uh, just a little more to that, uh, it's a, although there's, it's a popular discussion with regards to natural gas. Um, it's, you'll see in the, in the presentation that 
there is uh, fact and, and evidence that there is a need for energy and a need for fuel. What fuel that is and where it comes from, it comes from a lot of different places. Um, however, at this particular case, when it comes to the town of Sterling, there's some opportunities out here that we want to take advantage of or potentially take advantage of for the benefit of the town and the people of Sterling. Um, this is something that's happening nationwide. It's happening a lot in New England. I was just sharing with uh, Sean recently, we're involved in a, uh, another gas development project for the town of Lebanon and Hanover, New Hampshire. We're doing the very same thing that we're proposing or evaluating here for the town of Sterling. It's a demand and a need for cost-effective fuel, and natural gas happens to be one of those choices. So it is a very, very active market to be in, and it's a very uh, popular discussion, but it is an option for uh, cost-effective fuel. So as we go, as, as Mike described it, we're here to talk about um, the purpose of this effort was to determine or to evaluate whether or not Sterling should get its own franchise rights protected for the town's use rather than someone else's use. Two. You went two ahead. You went two. Skip one. I skipped one. Yep. Okay. I'm going to stay over here. So we got some new technology with some, uh, some uh, technology we haven't used before. So franchise rights, we're going to talk about what that, what, how did we get here and why are we here today. So as we described, the cost of natural gas has dropped significantly in the past number of years. Um, there's a transmission pipeline industry that's planning to expand in New England. There's a lot of talk about Kinder Morgan. Uh, there are other ones that are going on. There's PNGTS, Portland Natural Gas Transmission System. There's Spectra Energy that's proposing two projects that are will be impacting the New England area. So it's not just one company, but it's a number of companies that are trying to um, develop their system in New England. Um, there are a few options to source natural gas for the town of Sterling. So there's, there's pipelines and there's other methods to get it to the town, and we'll talk about what those are. Uh, natural gas provides a cleaner fuel option than coal or oil. So that's what we're discussing here today. Um, and currently, there are no franchise rights have been granted for the town of Sterling. So that's important because right now it's an open market with regards to uh, uh, where the owners of a potential system would be. So franchise rights are an exclusive right to install natural gas pipes in the public roadways. And that's important. So once these rights are granted by the town and then by the state, whoever that entity is, whether it be the town itself or another LDC, they own the rights to the public ways for natural gas pipes for distribution and no one else. So that's an important step. And the reason why we're here today is to ensure whether or not Sterling is prepared to allow that to happen or not. So that's the purpose of the franchise rights issues. What leads to that, now that you've, we'll say, embark on a franchise rights endeavor, is a system viable? Because that's the other part of this. Can, is it a viable system that can then uh, be developed and support the town as it grows. So currently, in Massachusetts, we have 351 towns and cities in the state. Uh, currently, with an LDC, meaning there is a, a national grid, an NSTAR, uh, Unitil, and so on and so on, there's 250 cities and towns that have an LDC. Um, there are 93 without an LDC, and there are four within the state today that are actively running their own municipal natural gas company. So those towns are Holyoke, Mass., Middleborough, Mass., Wakefield, Mass., and Westfield. And you'll see some of those are, for the most part, they're gas and electric. So 
having Sterling move to that uh, would be very common with regards to what those towns have done. And you can see here, so this is interesting piece here. So when you're looking at the LDCs across the state, this is where they're located. So each one of these shaded areas line up with one or one uh, LDC in the, in the region. So here we are at Sterling. You can see the inset here, and we have all these gas companies around it. So there's Columbia Gas of Massachusetts, there's NSTAR, and there's Unitil, <coughs> and here we are here. So obviously the, the growth of an LDCs have been primarily in the eastern part of the state, but you can see where the population areas are that LDCs have been established and, and uh, manage a system and provide that service to the local public. You know, one of the needs as we talk about what we need for natural gas or why do we have issues that we have today, one of the issues is cur curtailment. Okay, curtailment is, a, is an, uh, an occurrence that happens during very high peak energy draw seasons. So obviously the winter time when we have high energy use, high electric use, high heat use. What happens is these natural gas generators that produce the power for the state um, often run on natural gas. Um, as the natural gas is fed throughout the system and that high demand happens, as there's, if there's a, uh, uh, a reduction in available gas or it becomes not cost effective to burn the gas, uh, these power generators are moving to a backup fuel, coal or oil, all right? So, and throughout the year, they stockpile these, these reserves in the event that this happens. And what happens is those, those companies become curtailed so that because the LDC cannot restrict the flow of heat and gas to a resident. So the resident is very important in that process. So they have to get residential gas, and therefore the power generators uh, are curtailed on their use of gas and have to use an alternative fuel. So that's a very important issue there. Secondly, is the natural gas transmission pipeline system. Uh, currently in New England, there's an occurrence happening that we have a, an infrastructure constraint system. So here we are here. This is the existing transmission system. So the existing gas transmission system feeds natural gas to those local LDCs. So it gets gas all across the country. As this map grows and across the U US, it comes from the Gulf, comes from the Rockies, comes from Mexico sometimes, comes from Canada sometimes. But as the gas moves across this country on high pressure natural gas transmission systems, it flows and finds its way to New England. At present, these lines, this is the Tennessee gas system, this is the Algonquin system, this is the Portland natural gas and Maritimes and Northeast system. The natural gas in Spectra Energy and uh, Kinder Morgan or Tennessee gas system is constrained, meaning it is at its design capacity. It cannot push any more gas through that size pipe at any more pressure. So what does that mean? Anything that wants to grow or use more gas, it's not available because we cannot push any more gas into that system. That's what constraints are. And so when we talk about the need for a natural gas development, it's to relieve that uh, constrained situation on the gas transmission system. So that's, and as we get into some of these other slides, you'll see this, why, why do companies then propose projects to relieve that pressure and get that natural gas to, the, to the, those who are requir requiring it or requesting it? So here we are. Everyone's familiar with the uh, Kinder Morgan project. Um, this project will have, if it's built, would have a, uh, an effect on Sterling's ability to get gas to the town. Okay? Currently, Sterling could get gas from an LDC. So there's gas that can grow into the system. Now, those LDCs are shippers along that line. So in order for them to grow their system, that gas constraint has to come through the pipes as well. So whether you're, you know, whether you're going through NSTAR, or National Grid, or what have you, that gas is coming off the transmission system that they get and then pass on. So that, that process, we're not really eliminating the need for transmission. It's just coming through a different pipe with a different name on it. So 
In this particular case, uh, Kinder Morgan Tennessee Gas is proposing this project that would bring a new line here. And what it's designed to do basically is to serve new markets in this area, but also relieve the constraint along its existing system so that more gas can flow there as well. All right, so that's, that's the purpose and how it, uh, gas would come through that system and why. There are many other reasons. That's a Kinder Morgan presentation to give, but we're talking today about what that impact has to the town of Sterling. All right, so here we are. Here's, we're back at the LDC map. Uh, we're assuming, and it's an assumption, at this point that this line is built. And here we are here at Sterling, and there's an existing line. This line here is the Lemonster lateral. This line here is a, is a delivery off of that line. This is the Clinton delivery that comes into Clinton. So currently, these lines are, as I mentioned, constrained. We can, cannot fit any more capacity through there to feed the local LDCs. So this project would bring that capacity, available capacity, in the area. And Kinder Morgan is proposing to connect that line to its Lemonster line, which would then bring additional capacity to that system. Now, of course, this system needs work as well in order to accept that new pressure and, and new capacity. But what it does for us, it now, assuming they develop so that these lines can handle that gas, it allows us access to a capacity market that we didn't have before for the town of Stroh. So does that Kinder Morgan have to happen before we get gas? It's a, it's a major factor in it. Now, as I said, Correct. As I mentioned before, there are a number of ways to source gas. So that's a, uh, a very viable way of getting it. We'll talk about compressed natural gas and liquid natural gas in a second. But this particular effort that we went through did rely on that Kinder Morgan project happening in order for the system to happen here in Searle. All right. And again, we'll get into the other sourcing options as we go. A lot of the issues um, people may or may not understand is the safety aspect of natural gas pipelines. And of course, um, there are instances and things that happen along the years. A lot of the pipeline system in the United States is built in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and there's rules and regulations on how they're supposed to be operated and maintained. Um, pipelines and systems that are built today are also built under those same regulatory requirements. So there are a number of agencies that are, that systems have to pass through and operate under the watch of in order for it to be an approved system. So the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is the federal body that regulates gas transmission market. So in order for a project to be successful, it needs to first pass through the FERC process and the federal government has to accept it first uh, in order for that to happen. Um, the group that works in concert with FERC is the FIMSA, which is the Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Administration. That group is the group that oversees the safety, the, des the design factor, the safety factors, the construction requirements and the operations and maintenance requirements, and the life after the pipeline is built. Its, its physical integrity through its life has to be what is governed by this group here. Very rigid, very thorough process, which it obviously needs to be. Uh, again, and that's on the federal standard. Now we have the state, we have the Massachusetts Energy Facility Siding Board and Council. Uh, we also have the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities uh, and the Mass General Laws. Those laws and groups govern what gets built in the state itself. So when you're working through your, your project or a project gets proposed, we'll say like a Kinder Morgan, they have to first get through the FERC gates, the federal gates. Then once as it's being proposed or as it's being developed in the pre-filing process, they have to advance its efforts to, to reach out to all stakeholders. Stakeholders is anyone. It's the general public. It's the agencies, the groups, and what have you that have concern, issue, or impacted by a proposed project. So there's a process of pre-filing that those companies have to address those issues. Now, assuming they address those issues and have uh, uh, received the approval of FERC, only until then can they then start a project. Uh, 
but these laws are in place in order to ensure that it's been designed correctly, uh, constructed correctly, operations and maintenance plans that are performed correctly, but also meeting the needs and, and issues uh, of the general public. So those are our regulatory bodies. You know, as part of the pipeline safety process and installation, some of the things that people may not be aware of on a, on a natural gas steel pipeline. Steel pipe is used in the high pressure uh, situations. Uh, plastic pipe can be used in high, high, higher low pressures, but also down to low pressures that feed your house. But when we're talking about transmission or main line or trunk lines that help service a local LDC that moves gas around the town, um, we use steel pipes. Those pipes are joined through and in, installed in a testing process that is very rigid. So these steel pipes are, uh, are welded steel. So they're 40 foot joints that come together. They're welded. The, the thickness of the steel is determined based on where it's being constructed, whether it's being in a road or within proximity to schools, churches and what have you, and residences. The wall thickness is determined by the number of population and gathering areas. So the higher the population, the higher the gathering area, the thicker the steel, okay? That steel is uh, sandblasted at its joints. Uh, it's welded. It has to pass 100% x-ray the whole circumference of the pipe and all the way through the well. So it's x-rayed each and every well, every 40 foot, 20 foot joint, or a short joint, whatever it might be. If it's a welded connection, it has to be x-rayed. Those x-rays are then evaluated right on site and if there's a flaw in that well, they cut it out right then and there. They re-sandblast, re-grind, put the pipe back together and weld it again. And they do that until it passes its 100% x-ray to ensure that weld has the life expectancy it needs. That pipe is then hydrostatically tested. So before it goes into service, they fill that pipeline up with either, we call it hydro test using water. On smaller systems, they might use an inert gas like nitrogen and they pressurize it to one and a half times its maximum allowable operating pressure. So if we're designing a pipeline that's 1,000 PSI, it's going to be tested at 1,500 PSI. And it has to hold for a certain period of time, whether it be eight hours or 24 hours, depending upon where it's at. If it doesn't hold for that period of time, again, it has to be reinspected, re welds redone, find where the leaks are, and then test it again in order for it to be brought into service. After it's been uh, x-rayed, hydro-tested, they then go through a pigging process. And there's two levels of pigging. There's, caliper, there's cleaning that they send pig. Uh, a pig is a, a device that's pushed through the pipe that reads or cleans out the inside. So it's like a little bullet. It's got some bristles on the outside. And it passes through the pipe under air pressure. Um, so once it's cleaned, they then bring the caliper pig. And the caliper pig does it's looking for dents and out of round. So that device goes, gets pushed through the pipe. And as it's running through under pressure, it has wheels on it. And what it does, it calibrates what it's finding. So if it comes to a pipe that's out of round, it logs where that was. And then as that, once the, the run is done, they read that caliper run, measure down the pipe where it happened, inspect it. And if they can't find it, cut it out and repair it. So that's, that's one level of picking. The second level is the intelligent picking, which is actually a device uh, that can go through the pipe similar to the caliper, but it detects anomalies in the steel, anomalies in the coating, and anomalies in the weld if something were to happen in the weld. So it's actually another level of inspection under a higher, you know, uh, more intense device that can read anomalies in the steel uh, and in the coating and so on. And then wherever it finds it, it you read the data that it, it, it delivers. You go out to the pipeline and inspect it, find it, cut it out, and repair it. So all that has to happen before a, a pipe can actually go into service. So that just wanted to run through that, inspect the, uh, the testing and the inspection process to get an understanding as to how it works. Here are some of the, some of the devices we were talking about here. Is, this is an intelligent pig that you can see and it has a number of, of components that uh, are built around the unit so it can read the information it's looking for. This is a caliper pig uh, that has, collects the uh, footage data and any dents and rounds. As the information is tested on the pipe, you can see this pipe here 
is fusion bonded epoxy coating. And as the pipe is, uh, is built up on the side of a trench, trench is here, pipe is here, and as each weld uh, is tested and whatnot, every test, every person that touches that pipe for whatever reason has to document on the pipe what happened, how it happened. They're the welding inspector, the welder itself, everybody has a number on these jobs. So they can track what happened to that pipe throughout its life along the pipeline as it's being built. And then it's data logged and it's the obligation of the transmission company to monitor that data, evaluate the data and ensure that it was constructed and collected because throughout the life of that pipe, it's an integ what they call integrity management process that they can then, if there was an issue or um, a third party got into the pipe and they needed to inspect it, they could pull the record of when it was built and understand the pedigree of the pipe, the inspector, and so on and so on, and have the history of that so they can go to it and address it in the most efficient manner. Um, oftentimes they talk about cross-country projects, but we see more and more today that projects are being built in the roadways, and they're using existing rights of ways in order to <coughs> build infrastructure, whether it's sewer, water, gas. Uh, in this particular case, this is a 12-inch line. This was, would be the line size that we would propose to tie Sterling into that transmission system via a 12-inch pipe to be able to get that supply to the town. So this is the type of pipe that you would see. So it's only a 12-inch, all right? Its pressure would be determined on the pressure of the delivery line and what pressure requirements we would need for town based on what the consumption or uh, demand would be, all right? But that's our, that's our transmission pipeline in the street. And those same things that happen here in the cross-country environment happen here wherever it's built relative to a steel line. <clears throat> All right, so we're at the point where we've assumed that the pipeline is being built, Kinder Morgan's line is being built, it's bringing gas to that um, existing system that they have, the, the Lemonster lateral and the Clinton delivery. So our first task in the process was to determine what's the best or what's the options available to us to bring gas to the town. So each one of these routes was evaluated uh, based on where we could tie in, the most direct point, the least amount of impact to environmental wetlands, and so on and so on. So we had uh, one, two, three, four, five potential routes, actually more than that. We had, and some of them were variations of uh, uh, other routes. So these were taking advantage of existing roadways. You'll see these, a lot of these are existing roadways or in this particular case, an existing right of way that already, that's already there. It may not be for road use, but it's for other use, whether it be utility uh, or access route. Um, this one here is the one that comes off of the Clinton delivery. It comes up again, utilizing the streets to get to the town. Because of the position of the existing Tennessee gas system, it made sense to uh, you know, bring gas and have a, an end spot uh, on the northeast side of the town uh, in this particular case. So we chose, as we went forward with the evaluation, that we would take this route that follows I-90 and try to utilize that existing highway right of way as, best as, 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 as much as possible. So that's, that's the route that we use as to go further on with the evaluation. <clears throat> so here's our system overview. So here we are, the town of Sterling. Um, here's our, our high pressure pipeline, high pressure connection that comes into Sterling. Uh, at some point on this side of town, we'd find a lot that would uh, construct a metering and regulating station uh, in the event the pressure it comes in from Tennessee gas at 1,000 PSI, for instance, um, we put a facility in that would take that pressure from 1,000 PSI and drop it down to a level of like 200 PSI and then series of regulation down to lower pressures to service the town. So that would happen here. So we'd measure the gas that we received to, from Tennessee gas and when we would regulate it down to operating pressures that work for our system. Um, so now. What we've also done, and under no, you know, this is a, just a random, not, not so much a random, but the numbering is random, uh, areas of service. So when you're developing 
a local distribution system. Um, we want to identify areas um, that are clusters of larger groups to take advantage of, say, spending the least amount of money to get the most service to the greatest amount of customers. All right. So these, these uh, segments or zones were created uh, with that in mind. And we then went through a process to understand what that potential customer base was in these zones. Um, let's see, while I have it here, you can't help but notice this big yellow line, right? So that yellow line is what we would call uh, the gas main system, all right? Once we come off of the gas transmission effort and we regulate this pressure down to say something lower, under 200 or 100, we have generated what we call loops. And the intent of these loops is to, is to provide redundant delivery to any part of that loop. So if there was an issue here that we had to repair, gas could flow in this direction and fill the system uh, and not, we'd only have to worry about making the repair or the incident here. But we would provide redundant direction so that at any given point uh, along the main, no one would be necessarily shut off. So that's, that's what a looping system does. Of course, from that point forward, we then run streets and so on and pick up uh, services or customers along that route. Now, you may find that you know, there may be a long length like this that has a, uh, uh, a spider effect where it goes out and reaches out to d uh, different customers. The mission would be if there was enough customers that decided they want to do that, then you create loops as the system grows to provide that redundant uh, network. <clears throat> So here's when construction happens in a in a in a LDC system or distribution system. We use a lot of plastic pipe. Uh, it's 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 effective. Um, you can use plastic pipe up to 100 pounds of pressure. In some cases, 200, depending upon the wall thickness. And you can use that plastic pipe all the way down to services. So services can be inch and a quarter service pipe, um, distribution pipe. You know, three two to two to four inches in diameter. Uh, under low, low pressures, two pounds, and maybe into the house at 12 inches of water column. So it's less, less than one pound of pressure that actually comes into the, into the, uh, the house to, uh, to the uh, appliances and the burners and such. But that's what that looks like. So there's your meter on the side of the building for the, for the, uh, the uh, customer. In some cases, they have, we might go to a commercial area and have what we call a master meter situation or a group meter situation. Uh, and those meters are installed side by side like that. That's, this is typical distribution construction. Now, the same, there's a, there's a similar testing procedure for uh, plastic as well. So plastic pipe, once it's cut, in today's world, instead of using mechanical joints, in some cases, we use what they call fusion pipe. And it's actually uh, a heat transferred electronic fusion that melds the pipe ends together so they become one and rather than a separate weld itself or a mechanical connection. And again, this is the uh, trunk line system. I kind of covered that on the last slide. So this is, uh, again, a, uh, uh, a look at the, the looping segments. And these can be built in phases. The idea is to have a plan of, of uh, distribution main in which you can build out in an effective, cost effective manner and let the system grow as more customers want to come online. All right, so we'll talk about our data set. That's a good point. Let's just, uh, we're going to go back one slide and talk about our, our, our segment areas. I'm going to go back two slides, actually. So as you'll see going forward, uh, when we start talking about the data set that we use to um, uh, perform the analysis, we, we identified this zone one. 
And what you can see in this zone one was the highest concentration of industrial customers, the highest concentration of commercial customers, uh, and the closest to the pipeline. So what that does for the town of Sterling is it maximizes its customer base with the least amount of infrastructure and spending. So as opposed to bringing a pipe in from this side and running it all the way across town to get to that customer base. So we, when we first went through the process of identifying the zones, uh, we analyzed the data set that we had to say where's those biggest clusters are and what's the biggest bang for our buck. So that's where this zone one became very, very important. So we, we modified it a number of times to capture the most customer base. As the other ones grow, and you'll see in the, in the, in the, in the analysis, is that this area here represents well just about 55% uh, of the total load that we used based in this one area versus the rest of the town. So that is the highest concentration, okay? Got that? <clears throat> All right, so here we are at our data set. So what these numbers represent is we, ha we had a couple of ways to look at this. We could look at all the structures in town, which was kind of hard to do without doing an on-the-ground type evaluation because there might be a shed, a barn, or whatever. So what we did was we said we used, instead of the total number of structures, we used the total number of customers or meters that uh, Sterling Municipal Light Department has. And we used that as our data set, okay? So this is the uh, breakout of residential uh, customers, commercial, industrial, and power generation level users. Not that they're all power generators, but they, they use that much energy. So there's 3,737 uh, uh, potential customers. Now we also made the assumption, well, not everybody's gonna want to talk about this or to tie in or whatever. So what we said was, well, let's, for the, for the purposes of the evaluation, use a lower number of subscribers uh, to see where where we land relative to um, uh, customer base and revenue generation and how much cost it would be to build this out. So in each one of these areas, we assume that 30% of the residential base that our existing customers of, of uh, Sterling Municipal would be a subscriber to natural gas that would want it. So 30%. We assume that 75% of both commercial and industrial customers in town would want to take advantage of natural gas availability and 100% of those potential uh, industrial power generation level uh, customers would um, be a subscriber. So overall, you can see how that number plays out. It's about 34% of the overall town. Um, also, one of the evaluations we wanted to make was, you remember our, our network of mains. We said, well, how many potential structures or customers are a thousand feet away from that main. And that uh, was a number that we wanted to understand to say how far would the distribution network want to grow beyond the main itself or inside the main limits. So it was a pretty good number. So you can see that you know 44% of the residential base is actually a thousand feet or more away from the gas main. So all that is is a number. Um, that says, well, how far out we would go next to stay, to get other customers. Um, so that's kind of a larger number, but for the benefit of the town, I think as well is, we looked at how many commercial and industrial users are outside that. Well, literally only 9% of one and 44% of the other. So these numbers are pretty small, meaning we captured most of the commercial and industrial base within 1,000 feet or inside that uh, gas main looping system. So that was, the, that was the data set that we used in order to determine the gas load. Um, annual consumption. Um, every year, actually every quarter, the, uh, the United States Energy Information Administration and the U uh, Massachusetts government produces statistics on gas consumption for residential co base, for commercial base, industrial base. And we look at that, we use that as the basis of natural gas consumption for each one of these structure types on a per square foot basis. So someone that had a 1,000 foot structure 
used X amount of gas. Someone who had a 5,000 foot structure used five times that. So it was all based on a per square foot um, uh, determination of gas consumption, all right? In the natural gas world, when we're talking about measuring units, you have to take all your heating different types of fuels and bring it to a common unit or a common denominator. So when we're comparing natural gas to others, it's a, a British thermal unit is the heat generated by a fuel. And in natural gas, we measure it by millions of BTUs. So when you see in some of the other analysis, oil has a different uh, factor than propane, than electricity. Each one has a different BTU level. But we bring that to a common basis of, of uh, millions of BTUs to generate heat. And that's the units that we compare. All right? Does everybody get that? So we're, it's a common unit for all fuels that we determine and measure. So in this particular case, um, there are, just for uh, information, there are uh, 1,027 BTUs in one cubic foot of gas. So when you're looking at these numbers, we have a total of 333,766,000 BTUs, uh, I'm sorry, uh, cubic feet uh, of usage. So it's, it's, it's the units in which we measure gas. And then we boil that down to how many of those BTUs per day for each one of those structure types in those groups. That, that. <clears throat> so the next set, and we won't labor these things small, big ones, uh, small text too long, but the, the mission here was to show you that we identified the seven different zones uh, and, and how we, we evaluated the data sets. Uh, what type of, of uh, structure, how many cubic feet per zone, so on and so on, so we could establish a basis of developing that network uh, uh, and zone in which we were going to build out our system. Um, you'll see in here that this typically the regulators require that you have a two-day storage capability uh, in the system if you're not directly tied to an existing pipeline system. So if you don't have a firm capacity or, or a a direct connect to a transmission line or gas system, then you have to prove a two-day storage in order to operate your system. So that's what we wanted to ensure that we had that capability as well. Uh, but you'll see the number you'll see a lot of here is the estimated daily natural gas consumption by zone. So the total zones is 914,000 cubic feet of gas uh, per day for all structures in the data set. And then zone one, there's that 551,000 cubic feet of natural gas for that one zone. So again, that's that one that shows more than half of the load in that one, one area. Again, to maximize that description of zone. <clears throat> okay, so cost. This is the interesting one. So what we did was um, we have experience in the natural gas industry. Um, we have designed and built and managed and constructed uh, and actually operate and maintain natural gas systems. So we have a, a large data set that we use in order to estimate projects. So the way this is broken down is by, uh, by phase of work or segment of work. So the I-90 route that I mentioned before, it's a 5.4 mile transmission tie-in line. Uh, we're assuming that our gas load is just under a million cubic feet per day. Um, the estimated pipe size that we use for the cost is a 12 inch pipe, as I mentioned before. And then these are the phases of work, um, preliminary design, permitting, and legal efforts prior to any construction happening uh, is about $1.5 million uh, of effort for that particular piece of work. Uh, construction of that segment would be about 10.1 million for construction, that includes materials, testing, and all the things that I mentioned along the way, and all the mainline valves, and, and so on and so on. Uh, and the total for that pipeline effort is $11.6 million in our estimation. Um, and then we go on, as each one of these segments are built out, the trunk line, for instance, the trunk line is the yellow system. 
all right? So it's that gas main. It has 24 miles of gas main along those, the yellow gas mains that I, sh I showed before. And it's capable of handling that same uh, million cubic feet per day. It's estimated to be about a six inch line to handle that capacity. These, these sizes will fluctuate based on where the loads are at what given time. So, uh, but we've, we've used these for estimating purposes. And again, broken down by permitting, legal and design, construction and so on. The trunk line, so the 24.2 miles of trunk line is $13 million, all right? Now each one of these areas, as we go down, we use the same methodology. So area one, uh, we estimated of distribution pipe. So now we went from the transmission pipe to the gas main, now to distribution and service lines about 25 mile, 25.2 miles of distribution pipe within that one area zone one. And that's gonna carry that half the load at 550,000 cubic feet of gas at about a four inch pipe. Now the service lines come off of that. Service lines are the inch and a quarter with the, with the meter on the house. All those costs are, are roped into that same number so we didn't break it out a hundred different ways. Um, but that zone one or area one totaled about $10 million. So then we went on to the rest of the, the segments in the areas for a total, total build out of the entire system, $65.6 .6 million. And then we'll talk about how long that gets, or how that gets addressed throughout time. <clears throat> so we talked about the, the phased execution. Uh, as I mentioned, that's, that, the, the overall project would take numbers of years as customers wanted to come on, but we'll, from a cost effective perspective, that zone one or area one is what we would consider to be our phase one effort. So to break that down to an initial cost, we would need the transmission line for gas supply and capacity. We need a meter and regulator station to make that happen. Launcher receiver is a way to run the pigs that we talked about, how you run those pigs for inspection. Area one costs that we just described, um, and then we're into the segments. So segment, portion of segment, uh, segment A, uh, uh, main pipe, and segment C, meg, main pipe, and a piece of loop two pipe. So we took all the areas that would feed, all the components that would, that would service that one zone and broke out its cost independently so we could see how we could, what it would cost to address that larger group. So that number is $25.7 million. Um, for that one area. To get, so to get, zone one. to get zone one fully built out. Um, over here you can see uh, we, we put in here some, uh, again, some assumptions, but wanted to give you an idea of what the costs are on the, or the what the money is on the revenue side. All right, so we, we're spending a lot of money to build something. Well, we, we need to make money with this. So the assumptions that we made uh, was here's the 27, uh, 25 point, uh, point seven million at an interest rate of 5%, um, a 15 year note, the 15 year note matches up with the agreement that might be uh, presented by the gas transmission company uh, and broke it down by month and then by year. So those are your costs on the, to borrow the money uh, over those years. So it's $200,000 a month at 2.4 million uh, a year. So what goes into the cost of the charging the fees for gas? So for the cost of the project, we again broke it down into MMBTUs to that, to that basic unit so we could add them all up evenly. So we took the total cost divided by the MMBTU level here, and that's $11.81 per MMBTU. Cost of transportation, that's to get gas through the Kinder Morgan pipe. So they're building their pipeline, but they're gonna, they have a charge as well. And that's an estimation, it's not a, a bid or a number from Kinder Morgan. That's what we see in the industry, all right? So that's cost of transportation. Uh, then there's the cost of gas. And here's the interesting uh, number. This cost of gas is Henry Hub number, which is what the, this region uses as the cost of gas basis. So, and that Henry Hub is in the Pennsylvania, West Virginia area. So that's a low number, and obvious, for obvious reasons, there's a lot of supply uh, being discovered there, which drives that number down. So we use that Henry Hub number that's established by uh, the uh, 
uh, the gas market, federal market, and your cost to get gas and build the system. Uh, so now that total cost is about $18 per MMBTU. So then what we do is we say, here's the, uh, the MMBTUs for uh, that system times the $18 per MMBTU so with an annual revenue of about $4.1 million uh, for the town of Sterling. That, that would be a town of Sterling, Sterling revenue number. The MM is, is a year? No, MM is, a, is millions of BTUs. Oh, on the, on the, we said a 15-year note. Money, what is the time period for that? For the loan? 15 years to pay off the note. 15 years. What's the 1796? Is that, is that a cost that's sent over to us, the user? Well, that's, that, that's built into the rate, yes. So yes. The See this $20 per MMB to you? Uh, okay. That's what the end user pays. For MMBTU. All right. What is the time on that 17? That's what I was asking. This what is, is the time on that? This is based on a 15 year. That's 15 years. Based on a 15 year note. 15 year note. For the cost of the project. Yeah. So the question was, what, how long does that $17.90 charge uh, occur on an end user's bill, for lack of a better term? That number is based on a 15-year borrowing to pay off the project, this phase of the project. Okay? That doesn't mean that's the life of the system. Now, obviously, if the system grows, you spend more money, and that would go on over time. But this particular analysis was, this is the cost to build out this project. This is the cost of the project per MMBTU unit. This is the cost of transportation and gas. And that's the total. So $17.96 is the, is the total cost to get gas to the town of Sterling. Below here is a revenue stream compared to the cost. So revenue is that is, is this value. This is what the, we'll say, we assume the town would charge $20 per MMBTU per, to the end user, to the customer. As it collects from its customers based on this usage, that revenue stream is 4.1 million. The annual cost of the project over the 15 years is 3.7. The cost of operations and maintenance estimated at $250,000 a year. Nets a profit for the gas company of $171,000 a year. So those are the assumptions. So these numbers would change based on any one of those factors changing, all right? But that's how, this is a, 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 a very basic way to show how the money flows through cost of, or unit cost of MMBTU. So basically what you're, the, the company charges $18 in MMBTU, uh, rephrase that. It costs the company $18 per MMBTU, but it charges $20. So it's making $2 per MMBTU for every user or every BTU sold. Okay? Also wanted to give you some comparison information. <clears throat> so the comparison data is in today's market. All right, you can see that this is this is you can go actually you can go right to the website yourself at the uh, U.S. Energy Information Administration for Massachusetts on a monthly basis from January through June is the current data set that they provide of natural gas prices, customer prices. So you see here the residential city price is $14.70 per MMBTU, all right? Now you see the difference. Hey, that's $3.30 more than what we said. So we'll get to that in a second. But each one of those rates are identified here for commercial use, 
for industrial use and so on. And you can see how, you know, what's interesting is, as I mentioned earlier about how curtailment works and the, the power generators pay more and the residents can't be shut off, well, it's reflected actually in the cost. See that $13.66 in January is actually lower than it was in June. Whereas your electric power generators were paying $18.76 uh, per MMBTU versus four dollars in the summertime. So it's it's quite a fluctuation in how the rate structure works. Down below, um, this is market data. So again, what I wanted to show you is that you go on the internet and say, where can I buy home heating oil at so many dollars per gallon? So again, we had to break break that down and be able to compare it to MMBTUs. So here it is for natural gas is fourteen dollars and seventy cents. Cost of home heating oil is $25.71 per MMBTU of oil, $36 per MMBTU for propane, and for electricity, $38 per MMBTU. So obviously, you know, the, the reason, again, going back to the reason why are we interested in a natural gas system for sterling is to take advantage of that savings, energy cost savings, and provide a cleaner fuel versus a, uh, an oil or a coal fuel. So that's, again, those are values that you can look up uh, at home whenever you like. Now we also talked about, um, that was sourcing natural gas from the transmission company, all right? So we talked about the need for a transmission company to be able to provide gas. What happens if the pipeline doesn't get built? How does Sterling get its gas? Um, one of the markets that we're involved in is the virtual pipeline option. And it's a compressed natural gas solution. So in areas where, and that's a lot of this is happening in New England, where um, island communities or island customers, uh, factories are burning oil or coal uh, because they have no access to, to the pipeline, um, we can actually take natural gas off of the transmission system where it's available we'll say Pennsylvania, and we can compress that natural gas into a trailer and truck it to our end location. So that's why we call that a virtual pipeline. These components, these are compressors. They'll take gas off the transmission system at whatever pressure, high pressure, compress it into these trailers at 3,600 PSI, and these trailers can hold anywhere up to 450,000 cubic feet of gas. Um, so we'll, in the case of Sterling, um, each trailer is 450,000 cubic feet of gas. Our total load was not just over 900,000. So we would theoretically have two trailers a day being delivered to the town every day. Okay. Are those trailers delivered by uh, road or rail? By road. It's a, it's a, it's a common practice. Um, it's, it's relatively new in New England, but it's used tremendously in other parts of the country. Um, the other option, the other option is liquid natural gas. Liter uh, natural gas can also be um, liquefied at minus 260 degrees and moved along the roads in trailers as well, all right? Uh, and brought to an end, end user's site. Um, and that's also happening today over the roads, even here in New England. So this is not, neither one of these technologies are new, it's just not as common here in New England as it is in other places. But because of the effectiveness of what we've done here, um, we felt it was, uh, you know, what's the other option, all right? Um, we chose a compressed natural gas option because for storage, it's stored in a trailer in a gas form. Whereas if you have LNG, liquid natural gas, you store it in a tank in a liquid form. When gas is released from a compressed natural gas environment, it's gas, it immediately dissipates. In a liquid natural gas form, it has to vaporize first. So once it's released, it's a vapor. And that vapor can move with winds and breeze and what have you. So although it's, you can't store as much in a compressed natural gas environment, it does dissipate immediately versus a vaporization process. So we use this as the example. Now when we get to the cost side of this, you know, we, we saw the, the gas transmission effort 
versus uh, a compressed natural gas effort. So in a compressed environment, we have to have that facility, for instance, that takes gas off the pipeline, and then we need trucks to move it along the road, and then we need a location on in town to where that connection point would be that ties into the distribution system. So instead of a pipe, we have compressor, we call a compressor station, trailers, and an unloading station. So we load it, we move it, and we unload it. That cost is about $20 million. So it's $5 million less uh, for the, to, to meet the needs of that zone one. So that amount financed would be 20 million instead of 25. Um, and it's profit and loss value with the same values uh, uh, given is about twice as much as it would be with the transmission pipe. So this is $383,000 in profitability, potential profitability for a compressed natural gas environment. So, and there's factors associated with each one. You know, there's trailers that say, well, what if the weather's bad? What happens? Well, that's that two-day storage requirement that we talked about. So we would have two days of storage in order to um, account for bad weather or what have you uh, to make sure that we had that firm capacity to our residents and customers. And that's the end of the presentation, formal presentation. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I, uh, now I guess we'll take a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a question, you can go to the podium. I appreciate it. Sorry. <laughs> What's the timeline for all of this? That Kinder Morgan pipeline, What's the timeline for that? Uh, at this point in time, the Kinder Morgan has made its pre-filing. All right, that was the phase of, of filing that has to happen to go to the FERC for initial phases. That pre-filing happened September 15th of this month. They have one year to go through the pre-filing process before the, the FERC accepts it as a viable project, as, as a potential project. So that, that puts us at um, um, September 15, 20, 2015. They're proposing to be built by November 2019. Okay. So that's a four-year development process. Right. And then what would be the timeline for us to hook into them? The plan would be is to start our construction effort to be finished when they finish. Right. So if we, if we use the pipeline as the means of capacity, then our system would, would be uh, built at the same time and finished at the same time that they provide capacity, November, 5, November 2019. All right, one more question. If that Morgan Kinder line comes in, is it cheaper for us to wait for NSTAR to come along and lay pipes in here than we'll for us to do it? Yeah, Claire, that kind of gets us the franchise, and, and we, we wanted to make sure that the proposal would make sense if we were to build it. Well, well, by giving the, the light department the franchise, it, it also, there, the, the option could be that one of the other companies comes in. However, that basically gives us the legal right to negotiate what's on the best interests of the town. So that just like with the municipal light, you get a little lower rates, you get a little higher reliability, if several years down the road, if there was interest from one of the investor-owned utilities to, to build here in Sterling, they'd have to come through us and we could negotiate. And if it made more sense to do it that way, then certainly we could do it, but we could put in the protections to make sure that you know, things are done to the benefit of the town. It's, it's really whatever is, is in the best interest of all the ratepayers. Right. So you're it's, not locked in. You can no. negotiate with NSTAR exactly. or whoever. It gives us the legal right to negotiate. And the other part of the franchise is it gives us the right to um, start negotiating to, um, to make commitments to purchase some of that, um, the, the gas that's going to be coming through the pipelines. And that has to be done before um, you know, it's built basically, and so we can start negotiating and have the legal right to do that um, and, and getting the, the department ready if that's the route we go down to, to build like we talked about um, to begin the process of developing the procedures and the processes and um, the regulations for, for a gas distribution are considerably more stringent than electrical yeah. um, and so there's, there's an even higher level of, of safety requirements and so to make sure we can do it right, that gives us the time frame to do it. 
Um, but if, like I said, if down the road someone came in and said, we want to build, and, and that likelihood is increased now that there'd be more capacity, um, you know, we'd be the buffer yeah. to make sure that, you know, the residents of Sterling and the businesses of Sterling get a, the best deal they possibly can. And, and if that means, you know, All assigning right, so those rights, we'd have the right to do that. If in 2015, if they say, nope, we're not going to let the Tennessee pipeline come through here, then we look at the other option of the compressed gas. CNG. What's that well, time for? I'm going to be dead no. by the time. <laughs> Actually, you know, what Jesus. we've. <laughs> interesting. Very good question. And the, the permitting process within the state is much different. All right. So there's no federal requirement uh, because we're not crossing state lines necessarily. Um, our supply might come from those places, but we as, a, as, a, as a, an entity at, in Sterling, we're not regulated by federal government. We're regulated by Massachusetts government. Um, that permit process happens through the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities. And that permit timeline is anywhere from a year to a year and a half. So, and that depends on the size and nature and completeness of a filing. And that can happen in, in less time. For instance, I opened up by saying that the towns of Hanover, Hanover, New Hampshire, and Lebanon, New Hampshire, they're engaging in that process today, and they expect to have a permit in hand in a year or less than a year's time. So that time frame is much less. There's also the option of potentially combining the two. If, if we know that the pipeline's in process, it's been permanent, it's being built, there is the possibility of doing the compressed as a, a kind of a, a stopgap measure, okay. um, which would also, um, you know, so they can work in tandem. These are very modular units. That, that first picture you showed, that's the fill station, which would be, say, in you know, eastern New York or somewhere else. And I don't know, I think you skipped over the, the actual the station that would be here in Sterling is very small and, and they're largely modular. So if we discontinued using it later, you know, you could sell it or, but, but they could potentially work together. If we know for sure there's going to be a, a permanent source, we could explore the compressed to, to begin, you know, selling gas, getting the infrastructure in place. Okay. So, so that's, that's, the, that's actually the unloading station that would be in Sterling. And this, this particular facility is actually up and running in New England. It's in, uh, it's in Maine. And it's producing or moving the same amount of gas that we're proposing to move with the first phase. So it's about a half a million a day. Each trailer comes in, and this is basically it's just like, a, like you pull up in a gas station. It's got a, a unit here that logs, that has a hose, connects to the hose to the truck. Truck uh, unloads the gas through a series of regulators that takes that pressure down to a delivery pressure for our system. And this, this is literally about a, this is about a, uh, 200 by 75, or I'm sorry, 250 by 100 foot wide facility. And these trucks just, there's gates here, truck pulls in, he ties into these, the pipes go into the regulator and go out into the pipes. Or if we wanted storage on site, we could put storage here. And that storage would be the same amount that would be in the truck. So it's a very small footprint. And you know, to handle that first load of, of, uh, of zone one, as I mentioned, we, you'd, you'd have essentially three trailers, so you'd have, you'd have one on site all the time, one that goes back and forth, and one that's storage. So it's kind of a milk run, we call it a milk run, it just keeps going and going and going. So you have three trailers as part of your system. But this would be in town, and as Mike said, the compressor station would be wherever we put it to take gas off the pipeline system, and that could be in Massachusetts, it could be in New York, it could be wherever. Is that what they just built in Worcester? Yeah. That's what they're building. Yeah, yeah. yeah you Good. may have seen in the news that there was a proposal to do a similar um, project to this in Worcester. Just was in the news this week. So, I'm sorry. I have questions about the projections. So, obviously, we know it's more cost effective for the individual with gas and it's cleaner energy. So, you guys put in that the majority of the businesses locally would want it, uh, but the projection for us local citizens was pretty low. So, what happens if 85% of us wanted to tap in? You know, what does we that do to the cost of it? <laughs> I know. So, yeah, basically, it, yeah, I'm sorry. I need to cut. Um, basically, the, the industrial commercial segment, because of where it's located, makes the most sense. But it, as um, Ken said, it gives you the best bang for the buck and allows us the initial profitability to be able to expand the system. And so largely, you know, the phasing of those other zones, to a large extent, would come down to, you know, which are adjacent, but there's some options. And a, lar a lot of it is how many people in that zone are willing to sign up and commit to, to taking it. Because it's it's going to be what's most cost effective is the next area that gets built to a large extent. 
and, and, and managed correctly, these, these mains, we would size those mains for that future load. So the cost of that, of that initial build out, as others come on, there's, there's much less to be built because your infrastructure is in place. If you live in a neighborhood of 50 houses and you can get 35 of your neighbors to commit, you move to the top of the list. And that, I'll, I'd add that we asked Ken to, to his original projections were much more aggressive than 30% and was the board that requested that he pare it back because, you know, we, we, we wanted to be conservative. Okay. Do we have a pipe now that goes to the uh, place that makes the uh, uh, bituminous? The bituminous plant, is that a pipe? Yeah, yeah one, one of our customers did, did put in their own pipe because of the cost effectiveness of natural gas. They, they paid it their own money to do wouldn't it. Wouldn't that mean that we could get a pipe if they got a pipe? I mean, I see bringing tanks and distilling a hard sell at town meeting. Well, <laughs> I, I couldn't imagine yeah. selling it, two, two tanks a day. So remember, Malcolm, the, the pipe that's coming in over there, the customer's using it during the summer. During I the winter months, how much capacity is still available? And that's what Ken referred to earlier when he said the LDC. Well, he put in 12 inches, of course. Right, but, is, is, <laughs> but does the company provide? He put 12 it? inches. No, I understand, but the LDC. I'm, kidding, I'm just kidding yeah. you. Uh, Do they have but, enough? Just to clarify that a little bit. Sure. There's, two, there's different types of customers on the natural yeah. gas system. There's firm customers, firm transportation, and there's interruptible transportation. You as, as residents, are a firm customer, customer. meaning okay. you won't get shut off, all right? Interruptible yeah. is what oh, okay. the Panda Perkins they is. So they, they, now, of course, they have a lower rate, but if the, if the system, if the, if the, the system that they took gas from cannot meet his demand, then he doesn't get gas. So you get what you pay for, kind of, but Where's you also, drawing? he's drawing from the, uh, from the NSTAR system. Well, my reason for talking about this is for that $5 million difference between the pipe and the, and the tankers, we should really go for the pipe because I just think uh, the tankers uh, is more a liable, uh, you know, you have a changing station there for it. I mean, you have from the tank to the pipeline or to the storage, you, you've got a lot. A handoff. Just to clarify that. so. What we're saying is that that facility would still be here. That interchange with these, these trailer type systems, there's a transportation route that they take. So in this particular case, you have an interchange very, very, very close to the place that we would want that interchange to happen. So they only have to drive off the highway from here to that point, and that's it. They don't go anywhere else in town. We can actually restrict them from coming into any of the streets if we chose to. So they could take the interstate highways to get to the location and then allow them to get the site. So you can, you can manage that if you choose to manage it. And, and to, as it is today, Malcolm, there's, there's tankers on 190 that carry hydrogen and propane. Oh. One of the largest propane distributors in, in the region is here in town. <laughs> yeah, and so it already happens. I mean, it's... Yeah, they come to my house. So. But those... Thank you. Well, that, that facility that I mentioned, the compressor station um, that I showed you, uh, although not regionally here, it produces 5 million cubic feet per day. So and that particular station sends out about 10, 10 trailers every 24 hours. So those, those are very high production areas um, that use that technology and in a very small footprint. Questions? Any other questions? Obviously, there's a pretty big investment involved in this, <clears throat> and that investment will go over a period of time. If my electric bill was $100 a month now, do you have any estimate uh, as to what it would cost during this entire development phase uh, on my own bill? $100. It will stay the same. This is completely separate finance industry. Completely, the books will be run completely separate. From electric and gas will be two separate systems. You'll see the gas that you mentioned on mineral, gas, and electric, and Wakefield. They're completely separate. You would finance this infrastructure. He had mentioned 15 years. Actually, discussions with accountants and others. These assets are normally depreciated over 30 years. So your finance can actually go on 30 years if you want. That's a, that's a financial decision-making on your interest. 
Um, but this is would be completely financed through the gas department, revenue from the gas. You would fund this, you would start your infrastructure, start your payments, start receiving your revenues to pay back your, your loans, uh, completely separate from the, from the lights. Perfect. If the lights did some work or seed money on it, it all goes back during the financing process. So, so basically, Dick, one of the good things is you don't have to pay for it if you don't choose to take gas, but you get some of the benefits because um, you know, zone one is many of the town buildings are there, so that the town's own buildings will benefit from lower rates. Um, and then, of course, you have the benefits to the commercial industrial customer base of, of attracting and retaining businesses, which is one of the reasons the town has been so financially strong, because we have that strong tax base. And, you know, it, that has been a, a concern to some of the companies of deciding to relocate or whether to locate here, and the energy is a big portion of their costs. So this would help retain those businesses. We're going to pursue some, and we're hoping that, you know, potentially with the, um, you know, we're, we're going to pursue it. There's no guarantee to get them, but um, there's some federal um, DOE grants possibly, and, you know, because it is considered green energy to some extent. Mm -hmm. Michael, the microphone. Oh, I can't hear you on the television. That's sorry. Personally, I'm interested in getting the gas here. Uh, my concern only is how how much would this project depend on that Kinder Morgan route? I mean, it seems as though even Senator Warren is against that route, which I'm opposed to that. I'd like to see that gas come in. Uh, if that fails, are we out of luck? I think that was a demonstration on the press that to stash gas station if that Kinder Morgan line does not come in. So availability outside of here, which can probably right. speak a little. So <coughs> that would be a, that's an alternative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. but cur currently, what's happening is there's, as I mentioned before, this th that's where that Kinder Morgan line is being proposed. But there are other projects, as I mentioned. There's PNGTS that is this is the Iroquois Natural Gas Transmission System. Um, and PNGTS comes down from Canada. PNGTS is actually owned by TransCanada, all right? So this is a bi-directional line, so gas flows this way and can also come back down through PNGTS for additional capacity and supply. So where, where lines are, in this particular case, these two lines, it's not that they're constrained, it's there's not enough gas to fill them in, in, the, in, these, in this sense. So we could actually take gas and bring it this way as that capacity came in, we could, we could site one of those stations, a compressor station and or an, L, uh, an LNG storage facility in any one of these other spots, liquefy it or compress it and truck it to our location. Or this is Maritimes in Northeast and Algonquin. They have, they have three proposed projects on this line in the same timeline this one does. So we hear a lot about what's happening here because it's new transmission right of way. What we don't hear about is the same size pipe, the same size capacity that's being built along this system next to the existing line. So with the, and that's an interesting concept, right? Because we all know about what's going on here, but this is happening also. So that, that, that additional capacity is also being built on the spectra system. So there's gas coming into the area, so we could, we could negotiate some way to get that, that availability to bring it to site via uh, uh, tanker truck or, or, or compressed natural gas. So our project would not be contingent on this current political thing that's happening. This it's it's not necessarily. I mean, that would be the, the advisable way, but it's not absolutely dependent on it. Okay. And again, as, as in, in the event that there were a project, whether it's this one or some other one that presents itself, that increases the capacity in that system, you would then be prepared. You could still do the tie-in and now have a number of different sources for redundancy in your system. It might come at a cost, but it might be a cost that at the time in which it happens, A, you could afford and actually you know, make more revenue. I was just curious on um, the estimates for usage and all that, where that came from and how much potential for swing there is, whether it be increased or decreased potential usage and how that would affect cost. 
Um, the usage, as I mentioned, so the, the, uh, the United States Energy Information Administration every year collects the data for uh, natural gas consumption because the, the LDCs that provide the gas, they have to report it. They report how many residences they have, how many co uh, co uh, commercial base, industrial base, and how much each one uses. So that's part of their reporting process. So that data set happens actively every quarter. So it's constantly changed. So they then determine a factor per square foot of usage. So if the average, average home in Massachusetts is 2,000 square feet, then that factor times 2,000 square feet is what's used to get a cost per square foot. And that's how we use that data. Okay. So it was a live data set. And we actually started out by using a national data set. And we said, well, that's not the best representation because we're here in New England. So uh, we use that instead. And that, actually, that's a, a Massachusetts data set that we use. I had uh, another question for um, the storage. It was two-day storage. Uh, it'd be what, two tanker, uh, four tankers for zone one alone? Would all of the storage be in that one pump station? Uh, yes. OK. So but theoretically, what would it be once the full system is up all, what, seven zones, was it? Yeah, it's nine million a day. Okay. So the theoret theoretically, we would have storage for, um, for potentially 14 cylinders. Obviously, when scale happens, each one of those trailers are a certain size. We scale the equipment differently. We may decide to liquefy on site, and we can take that storage capacity down by seven times. So we can store more in a liquid fashion. And that's what happens like at District Gas and Hoppington and uh, Tewksbury is an LNG storage tank. Just, just to put a clarification on that, that, that C&G storage facility would be in lieu of a pipeline. The pipeline did come right. in, that requirement right. wouldn't be. Would go away. Would go away. So if the Kinder Morgan doesn't go through and no other pipeline was developed oh, and we decided to go ahead with the, uh, the pump station, we would have a two-day storage. We'd be required to have okay. a two-day storage if we went ahead with a pump station. That was his question. Okay. Yes. Excuse me. Well, the, the difference is if the pipeline is there, there would not be a, a need for compressed natural gas. It's not, it's not a choice of one versus the other if it's one doesn't exist. So if the pipeline doesn't happen, there's no gas. You won't need to take that. No, well, that I would go, that, I'd go to when you could it. get the pipeline. Mm. Right. Yeah. If, it's, if it's 20, say it's 2,000 and... Malcolm, 2000 they can't hear you with the discussion on the, on the TV. Okay. That's oh, okay. Mm -hmm. they can't a question up there? Um, sorry. Does anyone else have a question? That, that's my I have one more. Okay. What's the next step for the town? Do we go to a town meeting to get yeah, this to the, say, okay? Be, we're going to hold this, assuming that there's not any overwhelming opposition, we'd have the, the second special town meeting um, late this year. Okay. And if the town votes that, then we legally have the franchise, which lets us continue planning um, whatever negotiations that involve. Exactly. Okay. So. That's all right. I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you for the support. We have your emails here. We'll be setting up a database of those emails. If things change, as questions come up, we'll send you information out to you. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. We're adjourned, yeah.